Hi, everyone, and welcome to Dead to Rights, the podcast, episode 15, titled The Monkey, the Croc, and the T-Rex. I'm really excited about the fantastic guests we have lined up in the coming weeks. On April 15th, we'll bring you author John Strother, founder of the Friday Flash online Twitter hashtag and story compilations, as well as the Best of Friday Flash anthologies, Volume 1 and 2. Then, on Sunday, April 22nd, I'll speak with Canada's funny lady, Melody Campbell, author of the Goddaughter series of Crime Capers, as well as the fantasy series Rowena Through the Wall. On April 29th, we'll host criminologist, organized crime expert, and true crime author Stephen Matelski. It's safe to say we have a fabulous lineup scheduled for listeners, and each one of these authors will offer tidbits and advice for newbie writers who are struggling to break into their genres. Today, we're thrilled to bring you guest author Janet Kello, author of The Bathwater Conspiracy and the acclaimed 19th century Thaddeus Lewis mystery series. And, as always, we're going to tell you a story. Whether you're out for your walk, your jog, at the gym, or simply climbing into your car for your daily commute, we want to thank you for joining us. Nothing brings me more pleasure than picturing you plugging in your earbuds and settling down to allow me to read you a story. Today I bring you another strange little number by Alec Carrick from his book Five Scoops is an Addiction, titled The Monkey, the Croc, and the T-Rex. This is Alec's version of how various characters may view global and unstoppable changes and how their reactions will dictate their ability to adapt and thrive. But before we start our story, a quick word to our writers out there on the topic of change. How would you rate your flexibility factor? Are you exploring new forums for your work? Are you reaching out to readers where they live? I spoke the other day with author Michael Jex, who pointed out, as so many successful authors do, that the business of writing means getting busy with your writing. Discipline, people. He went on to say that in medieval times, writers and scribes, most of whom were in the clergy, had no computers. In fact, they didn't even have ink flow pens. They used an ink box and a quill. Times have certainly changed, and I think it's safe to say the past decade has brought a waterfall of developments to our beloved industry. Kindle, Smashwords, Nookbooks, Audiobooks, Print on Demand, Social Media. These are just a few of the key words we're now all too familiar with that were unheard of until recently. If you have not embraced the day as a writer, the day will indeed pass you by. I know it's hard. We love the self-image we've crafted of the writer in the garret, thinking and scribbling down beautiful, meaningful thoughts without a care for the outside world. Well, welcome to the 21st century. If you feel strapped and helpless and don't know where to turn in this brave new literary industry, reach out to a friend. You can always contact me through the Dead to Rights Facebook page if you have questions you think we should be addressing on the show. I'd love to help, and I know our guests will feel the same. And with that, I hope you'll enjoy my reading of The Monkey, The Croc, and The T-Rex by Alec Carrick, brought to you by Carrick Publishing. The Monkey, The Croc, and The T-Rex by Alec Carrick Dinosaur Spots Comet in Sky That's the headline I'm going with, said Dilly the Crocodile to Tony the T-Rex, as they faced each other across the entranceway to the latter's luxurious cave. It was the most modern of eras in an alternative universe containing the 88th iteration of Standard Earth, where the animals had evolved to rule the planet and humankind was nowhere to be found. Dilly had received his rather silly and sophomoric nickname years ago, but had come to appreciate its value for disarming interview subjects. He worked as a reporter. The name of his paper was the Daily Drumbeat, since that was the method by which the news was distributed. 
Tony the T-Rex was mayor and financial mogul in this particular zone of the jungle. Why have you come to me with this story? asked Tony. I thought I should give you a heads up, said Dilly, and present you with an opportunity to confirm or deny it. Why would I have anything to say on the subject? Because you're the dinosaur referred to in the article, said Dilly. What? Preposterous! Tony took on an expression of outrage. Mandrake said you'd huff and puff about it, Dilly answered calmly. Tony gave Dilly a quizzical look, like he'd never heard the name before. You know Mandrake, right? The monkey. Short little guy. Screeches a lot. He's a stargazing friend of yours. You belong to the same astronomical society, said Dilly. Oh, that Mandrake. Yes, I do know him. A very pleasant chap, but apparently delusional. A wary look crossed Tony's face nonetheless. Dilly was neither fooled nor distracted. He told me the two of you were on Space Cadet Hill last Saturday night when you saw an anomaly through your telescope, a comet coming straight towards Earth. He took a look as well and confirmed your sighting. No, that's absurd. I never saw any such thing. He indicated you'd say it wasn't so. The implications for your kind are too dramatic and terrifying. I'm guessing dinosaurs will be wiped off the face of the earth. You're likely to become extinct. If that was true, it would still be well into the future. And don't you think all life forms would be destroyed? asked Tony. No, I think the rest of us would probably be okay. Sure, there'll be lots of chaos, but we'll emerge in pretty good shape in a million years. We can get by on a lot less than you. We don't need the same excessive level of fueling. Tony looked stunned. There's also the other matter, said Dilly. Tony was startled from his reverie. What other matter? he asked. According to Mandrake, you may have a bigger and more immediate worry. How so? He says your publishing empire is crumbling. What nonsense! No, what he says makes sense. You've been an intermediary between monkeys who write and monkeys who read, although they're not mutually exclusive for decades. Let's examine your business model. Tony stared ahead, clearly struggling to maintain his composure. Dilly proceeded. You take the work of one specific monkey, reproduce it, and sell it for several coconuts each. It's a good system, said Tony. I'm not so sure, said Dilly. This way, you keep the coconuts and the writer monkey gets paid in chicken feed. I act as guardian, said Tony. A lot of rot is brought to me. I filter out the weak material and let only the best work through. But you can't deny your opinion is largely subjective. I have faith in my superior taste, Tony said rather huffily. In any event, the monkeys have made a discovery. With their two opposable thumbs, they can not only write, but mass-produce their work as well. They're planning to establish their own distribution channels and keep the rewards for themselves. Tony tried to look impassive. They'll no longer need your approval, said Dilly. They know I've only been working in their best interests, commented Tony. Again, I don't think so. As guardian, you may ask for the exclusive right to judge their work and then sit on it for months before issuing a form letter of rejection. But, but, you've also been playing it pretty safe lately. Tony's confidence took a beating with this jibe. He knew where his vulnerabilities lay. The material you've been publishing has been following a formula. Brontosaurus sleuthing novels, biographies of famous pterodactyls, stories about romance in the stegosaurus set that are so sweet they can rot your fangs. You should see the junk that's submitted to me, Tony almost pleaded. I don't doubt that's true, said Dilly. I'm always receiving undead monkey stories with accompanying letters that read this one's completely different from all the others because of some minor change in the protagonist. 
Dilly sensed an opportunity to inject some levity. You mean, as opposed to just two, our hero has nothing but opposable thumbs, he asked. Yes, exactly, Tony exclaimed. Dilly's creative juices were flowing. That way, whenever the vampire monkey thinks about sucking blood, guess what he chooses to suck on instead? The T-Rex was starting to share in the fun. Thumbs, twenty of them, one after another, slurp, slurp. Our monkey hero becomes a force for the pacifiers rather than for evil, joked Dilly. In their nervousness, they both laughed a little too much. Tony acted impressed. Say, you're good. You should be writing fiction. Sure, said Dilly, when I get tired of my non-fiction day job. The moment passed, and the realization slipped in that they were far off topic. Dilly was surprised by Tony's countenance. It seemed hardly credible that a T-Rex could look sheepish. Dilly revved up again. If someone has something to say, and a new discovery makes it possible for them to reach an audience, why should they hold back? Tony snorted, and the odiferous blast flattened Dilly to the ground. When he recovered, he threw Tony a baited lifeline. Mandrake says there is one thing that might save your business. What's that? asked Tony. Tony's breathless enthusiasm belied his assumed indifference. Experimentation is integrating the written word with live action. The media event will be half book and half theater, said Dilly. That's a good point. It'll be a hybrid, said Tony. Yes, and only the wealthiest can afford to stage mini plays, added Dilly. A mischievous twinkle snuck into Dilly's eyes. Mandrake says he's tried to talk his wife into live action scenes a couple of times. She always says no, and sometimes gets pretty angry about it. He held back the wink and the nod, and the you-know-what-I-mean elbow nudge. Hmm, said Tony. After a heartbeat or two, he followed with, Huh? Tony's look of contemplation was replaced with one of annoyance, as he realized he was being joshed. A change of topic seemed in order. So, do you really think I saw the comet? he asked. Yes, said Dilly. You can't publish that. It will send all my friends into a panic. Are you trying to be a guardian again? queried the croc. Yes, someone has to do it, and I'm best qualified. I don't think so. Dilly wondered how many times he'd used that phrase. He was no longer saying it with petulance, but rather as the sum of quiet reflection. Tony wasn't prepared to give up the fight. You don't think so? What does that have to do with anything? I'm the mayor. I'm a dinosaur in position of authority. The croc straightened its tail, stood on tippy toes, puffed out his chest and raised his jaws in the direction of the T-Rex looming over him. That's fine, but let me tell you how I view my reporting job, replied Dilly. I think I'm supposed to say what I think. The End, and that has been The Monkey, the Croc, and the T-Rex by Alec Carrick. And now let's give a great Dead to Rights welcome to Janet Kello, author and storyteller who has written and performed in numerous stage works that feature a fusion of spoken word and music. Her previous books include The Palace of the Moon, The Pear-Shaped Woman, The Legendary Guide to Prince Edward County, and the Thaddeus Lewis novels On the Head of a Pen, Sewing Poison, 47 Sorrows, The Burying Ground, and Wishful Seeing. She lives in Prince Edward County, Ontario, Canada. Rot. Hi, and we're live now on Dead to Rights with Janet Kello. Thank you for joining us on the podcast, Janet. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to talk to you because you've got some very intriguing uh, books I've seen online. I'm talking about The Bathwater Conspiracy, which is a yes. detective's McHenry and Huen mystery set in post-apocalyptic near future. Um, have I said 
win properly. Will you say that for us? Uh, win. Yeah, it's like win or lose. Okay, okay, very good. Like win or lose. Uh, I like that. For our listeners, that's spelled N. Yes, I, yes, I knew it was Vietnamese, but I wasn't really sure on the pronunciation. Um, for our listeners, it's spelled N G U Y E N and pronounced win. Um, in the story, violent crimes like savage beating deaths and rapes have been all but uh, done away with in, in the time period. Um, but what is it about the murder of Alfreda Longwell that drives your heroes to begin an unofficial investigation into the crime? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Detective McHenry is, is kind of a rebel. There's a very, very sort of hard-boiled noir um, feeling about this book, even though it is speculative fiction. Uh, she's a police officer. She's been sent to witness this autopsy. And first of all, just the level of violence that was inflicted on this poor girl um, uh, it just really shocks her. Uh, you know, even though she's a police detective, it's it's the kind of crime that that just is has not been seen uh, in many many years. Secondly, she's warned off um, asking any questions about this strange autopsy. The um, the federal police are involved in it, and they just kind of shut down the case really really fast. So that intrigues her and and sets her off. Um, uh, you know, asking a few questions and. And she also uh, kind of has a thing for the medical examiner, and the medical examiner is equally shocked and equally curious about what's going on, and that kind of propels the whole thing forward. Okay, and what's the medical examiner's name? Um, uh, she is um, Jo Hines, Jo Norris Hines. Okay, yes, I came across the character name in my research, yes. Okay, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't make um, the connection. Uh, not actually, you know, a, a, a typical kind of partner um, sort of series in, in any way. Um, McHenry is the main character, and, and Wynn sort of gets involved because she's a junior officer, but it's it's not set up in the usual sort of, you know, these are your, your two detective characters, and you're going to be seeing a whole lot more of them uh, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I have no idea where this is going. <laughs> I love the title, though, The Bathwater Conspiracy. It really is. A, it's a fun title for a very gruesome kind of uh, mystery, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it, it's, um, I, first of all, I, I started out because I really wanted to uh, write a book where all the major characters were women, and yet, you know, I didn't want it to be a chick book or, you know, princess warriors or mm-hmm. I mean, it just, just ordinary women doing their jobs. And I sort of played with that for a long time. And then, uh, like most crime writers, you know, you follow along the news and you look at the crime news and you follow the, the murder investigations. And just one day, I, I was just absolutely shocked, really, by the number of brutal murders and violent crimes. And, um, and I got to thinking, well... Uh, you know, what would happen if you lived in a society where these kinds of really horrific crimes didn't happen? How would you react? Mm-hmm. And those two concepts kind of came together. And uh, and I said, okay, well, let's just start writing this and see where it goes. Yeah, so you're talking really about the resensitization of society because we talk about society having been desensitized by these horrific crimes. Um that Absolutely. happened just far Absolutely. too I mean, often, all, in particular against women. We cut, cut and we're shocked at the time, and then, you know, we go on about our business and we forget the details and everything until the next one happens. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, and, and this, this is not a healthy society. So that was one of the things that I wanted to take a look at in this book. Mm-hmm. What if you took a more healthy society and threw something really bad in it? What would the mix become? Uh, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Now, I know from personal experience that place, geography, location has a lot to do with our muses and with making us right. And I'm not just talking about the the locations we set our stories in. I'm talking about the locations we set our asses in when we write. Um, pardon me. <laughs> and can you share with us how living in Prince Edward County, which is on the north shore of Lake Ontario, can act as a, an invitation to you to write? 
intertwined with my writing career. It's not funny. Um, Prince Edward County has become a, a, a very sort of fashionable, you know, kind of place to come and visit. It's a destination now. But I, I actually, I have always lived here. I'm multi generational Prince Edward County, and the the core population of Prince Edward County is actually all interrelated and intermarried, and it's very, very complicated. Mm-hmm. However, because of that, there has always been this wealth of of story in the county, the, the county's history, uh, the county's folklore, legend, gossip. Um, it, it's a big, big part of life here in the county, and that was originally, you know, what got me telling stories because I heard bits and pieces of things growing up, and as an adult, I wanted to... Um, you know, sort of reacquaint the county with a lot of these stories, and we were having a lot of new people move in, mm-hmm. and it seemed to me very important that that um, this wonderful wealth of story be not only saved in a you know in a library somewhere, but part of the psyche uh, mm-hmm. uh, of the population, and that's really what got me started to begin with. And for people who don't know and are not familiar, uh, maybe you're listening outside Canada, Prince Edward County has become and is becoming really almost a center for the arts and, and literature in Canada. Um, people always talk about they're going to a book fair in the county or, or there's always something going on in Prince Edward County, isn't there? It, it's a happening place. I'm telling you. Telling you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, uh, your novel, Wishful Seeing, is part of the Thaddeus Lewis series, and it was a finalist for the Arthur Ellis 2017 Best Novel. I've spoken with a number of authors lately about awards because it's something I'm very curious about, whether they do or don't affect our future writings, um, having won or been nominated for an award, having industry recognition. Does it have an impact on your writing? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, I have my own thoughts on the subject, but I'm interested to hear what you think about that. Um, That nomination came at a really interesting place for me. I was at a real crossroads uh, with my writing. Um, The Thaddeus Lewis series is historical mystery, and uh, the history that that it deals with is Canadian history, upper Canadian Canadian history, Victorian, sort of mid-Victorian, um, which is, is kind of outside, it's kind of a side sort of road for mystery writers anyway. It's a, kind of a sub-genre. Um, and, uh, now, a know, couple of writers have done, it, have done it brilliantly. A couple of writers have handled that, that particular time, setting, and region quite brilliantly. But, but carry on. Yes, you were saying. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's not your standard sort of police procedure or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So you're kind of outside, um, uh, you know, the, the, the community in a, in a bit of a way. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what they did was they told me that I, I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, they said, yes, your stuff is good because the, you know, this, this award is, is not a popularity contest award. This award is decided by my peers. Yes. And what they said to me is, is yeah, you're doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that gave me the confidence, I think, um, uh, to carry on, um, you know, I I always felt I was a pretty good writer, but what that said to me is, yes, you are a good writer. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's tough for artists of any discipline because you you know you put so much of your yourself into um, the works that you're producing, and then you have to trot it out there. That's and exactly let people right. Have a look at it, and you know, there sometimes you, people say nice things. Sometimes people throw rotten tomatoes at you, and. Um, you know, so having that recognition from my peers, you know, was just a, a, a huge shot in the arm for me. That's wonderful, because I, I agree. That's exactly how I feel about it, um, about the industry recognition and the acceptance within your industry. It really is a nod to, yes, please continue. And what you said about Rotten Tomatoes is so true. There is no such thing as an art that is accepted by everyone. And as writers, we have to know this going in. Um, There are people who hurl tomatoes at Dan Brown, you know. 
And, uh, you know, I can't think of a more successful writer right at the moment. There are people who are still hurling and have hurled for years at uh, at uh, Margaret Atwood, you know? Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, with, with all of the online reviewing and, and there's there's so much more uh, sort of reader um, response that you hear about that, that you didn't use to. Mm-hmm. And... And you have to stop and remind yourself that it's a very subjective reaction mm-hmm. on their part. They are not professional reviewers. That's right. Um, you know, what they're giving you is their gut reaction to your work. And sometimes you just don't connect with people. And, and mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that the, the work is not worthwhile. It just means it wasn't wasn't the book that this reader yeah. wanted to read yeah. at that particular moment. Thank you for saying that too, Janet, because reader engagement is such a critical part of this changing industry. It's something mm-hmm. that we did not see as writers in the past, um, and we often bemoaned the fact that we didn't engage with our readers in the way we wanted. Um, and reader engagement is is so critical to the way we're moving and changing, and yet it sometimes can really astound you what gets out there. There are, yes, there are people who just don't like your work. That's obvious. You've got to have a bit of a thick skin about that. But what I've seen is that there are also people who I call them online vandals or vandal reviewers. And uh, I don't want to invite anything by saying this. I have been blessed not to be the target of that. But I have seen other writers be the target of a reviewer who has so obviously not read the work. Yes. And who just yes. takes their enjoyment by going online and publicly belittling. And uh, Amazon at one point was so aware of this that they started removing all one-star reviews. So what these vandal yes. reviewers started doing was giving two stars <laughs> to get oh, around oh, that. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. it, it's, it, I, you know, I don't know what you do about it. No, um, you just have to get a thick skin, I, guess, I think, oh, and carry it, on. It's just keep writing for the people who do like your work and yeah. just ignore the rest of it. Because and when you can come out, when you can come out, Janet, with wonderful titles like what you've got, The Heart Balm Tort, I mean, that's a fantastic okay. title. Um, Wishful Seeing, that's a that's a fantastic title. When you can come Thank out you. with these things and have a publisher, an e-publisher like Dunder and recognize it and work with you on it, you've got to know you're heading in the right direction. You really do. Well, I I'd like to think so. I um you know, I I spend a lot of time on uh on stage. Um basically telling stories and I worked a lot with musicians and so forth and so on. And um it it was it was a really good education for what I'm doing now because if you're on a stage and you're losing the audience, you know it right away. Yes. And you know, like the programs start to rustle and they're looking at their watches and there's uh, an instant know, engagement, an in instant seat, review. Sort of like, <laughs> and and I learned that you just have to say, okay, take a look at what you were doing and what didn't work, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then go back and do something about it. So that was a good preparation for this. Yes, I would think so. I mean, I, I and the intertwining of the arts to me is fascinating. I, I love hearing you talk about being on stage. For me, whenever I find that I just can't write, what I will mm-hmm. do with my husband is go downtown and go to the art galleries and the art shows and the oh. basically the, the painting stores, for want of a better phrase. And we'll right. just look at all the wonderful Canadian artists who have toiled and put their work out there. And uh, in many cases, in many cases, never, ever experienced the kind of recognition that they deserve during their working lives. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think... I think that's just part and parcel of, of being an artist, mm-hmm. you know, in any discipline. You have you have to be doing it because you, you love it. Yes, yes. Your artistry because has you to shine through. you can't anything else. No, you can't. You really can't. No. <laughs> and I bet if you ask the top writers, the ones who are recognized as the top writers, they'd tell you the same thing. I know that yeah. Giles Blunt definitely says that. He says, don't write for any other reason than that you love it because nothing else is guaranteed. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's 
absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. Absolutely correct. Now, I want to ask you about uh, the Women Killing It Crime Writers Festival, which is scheduled yeah. for yeah. Prince Edward County. This um, schedule is going to be in Prince Edward County on Friday, August 31st, and Saturday, September 1st, and that's the Labor Day long weekend. Uh, we did our inaugural festival um, last year, and I uh, had no idea what was going to happen. And, and when I say we, it was sort of me and Vicki Delaney, and, uh, who's, who's also bestseller um, yes. uh, mystery novelist. I know Vicki um, very well. Yeah, we'll give a plug uh, yes. for her. And, uh, and we pulled in Christine Renault, who's, who's a very talented graphic artist and kind of a community organizer, and put our heads together with uh, David Sweet, who's the owner of the local independent bookstore and said we want to have a crime writing festival and it's all going to be mystery and it's all going to be women mystery writers wow and they all went cool (laughs) (laughs) so so we did we did our um our our initial festival last year and and we're just to use the english term gobsmacked um at the response we got that's fantastic. It was more fun. It was very successful, and so we're going to do it again. Mm-hmm. And I'm pleased to let everybody know that uh, Gail Bowen is going to be one of our oh, authors. That's wonderful. She's a terrific yeah. author. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, Gail, the Joanna Kilburn Mysteries, of course, um, mm-hmm. and Gail also has a, a new book out about writing. So she's going to be one of the featured authors, and she's also going to give a workshop. Terrific. Um, we have Kim Martsugu, uh, R.M. Greenaway, Linda Wicken, Carol, Carol Souls. Oh Catherine my gosh, Stonehall. so many names I know. Carol Souls, I know, Linda Wicken. And Vicki Delaney, uh, oh, and me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you, Vicky Janet Kello, yes, uh, let's say that. <laughs> Our workshop last year was so successful that it was just completely overbooked because we messed up the tickets. Oh. Um, so we're going to have two workshops. Uh, uh, this year, so how can people um, sign yeah, up if they want to come out to the county? To and I should let everybody know it's a very small festival with very limited seating, mm-hmm. but it's very, very intimate. So they and should sign up you, early. You, they should sign up early. Um, uh, you get all kinds of chances to to talk with the authors. It's not one of these deals where they're standing up, you know, uh, in, in front of you and you have to put up your hand and ask a question in front of God and everybody, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you can walk up to our authors Good. and, and Good. have a conversation. It's it's that very, very intimate kind of um, uh, kind of experience. So we'll see how it goes. And that's the Friday and Saturday of the Labor Day long weekend, August 31st and September 1st. And how can people sign up? Um, okay, we don't have the, the tickets out for sale, but we will have tickets available on Eventbrite, and we'll be publicizing it through um, our page on Facebook. That's Women Killing It Crime Writers Festival. We have a Facebook page. And as soon as our tickets go on sale, we will be letting everybody know. Okay, so please go to the Women Killing at Crime Writers Festival Facebook yeah, page. And, and we'll have a link there that will take you to the ticket outlet. You like the page online. and watch for the news. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I always do a segment about tips for writers. Um, I'm particularly aiming this usually at new writers or any writers who may be stuck on a certain thing. And I don't like to guide authors on what type of tips they want to give. Um, Is there a tip that you think is really particularly useful in in the crime or mystery genre? Um, I, I think in any kind of writing, you should start with the thing that's most vivid in your head. And that can be a scene, it can be a character, it can just be an image that you have in your head. And that's where you start. And when you start with that, you have no idea where in the work it's going to end up. But you sort of work backwards and forwards from there. Mm -hmm. But if you start with that one vivid thing, you stand less chance of actually getting stuck trying to get to that one vivid thing. Or trying to create something that isn't natural to you. And and actually, you're speaking like somebody who's been on the stage. You take an image and you flow with the image. Um, And that's exactly what I think, too, about writing. I always start with a character, and the character is almost always standing in the doorway in his or her full regalia, ready to take me on some kind of journey. Oh, nice. 
Yeah. Nice image. Yeah. Nice image. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. So start with what's in your mind, people. Start there. Yeah, uh, and, and you'll be surprised. And, and don't have any preconceptions about where you're going to end up because you can end up in the most bizarre places. Yes, your good guy may be a bad guy. He may be. <laughs> or your you good girl know. may be a bad girl. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Thank you so much, Janet. I really appreciate you coming on Dead to Rights. And uh, I'm going to just pump one more time. Go to the Women Killing It Crime Writers Festival Facebook page, like the page, and watch for the news. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And look for Janet's novels, um, Wishful Seeing and The Heart Balm Tort. And the Bathwater Conspiracy, look for them online. You're going to find them there, and I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Janet. Let it rot. I want to send a huge thank you to Janet Kello for joining us today on Dead to Rights, the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed her interview as much as I did. You can find Dead to Rights at deadtorights.ca or at our Facebook page. Our Twitter handle is at dead to rights Pod. We'd love to hear from you at carrickpublishing.com or at our Carrick Publishing Facebook page. You can find me, Donna Carrick, on Twitter, at Donna underscore Carrick, or at my website, DonnaCarrick.com. Likewise, you can find my husband on Twitter, at Alex underscore Carrick, or at his website, alekkerrick.com. If you're a published author and would like to join our listeners on the pod, contact me at carrickpublishing at rogers.com and say schedule me for an interview. I hope you'll join us next week when I'll be speaking with John Strother, the founder of Friday Flash and the Friday Flash Anthologies, and an author in his own right. Our Dead to Rights theme song is Eyes of Gold, composed and performed by Ted Carrick, who also brought us the original story scoring music for this podcast. Thank you, Ted. Dusty road, a man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold. And I told you what you told me. We'd never be in the same boat for free, yet it rides, let it rot.